Welcome to Conversations on Healthcare. This week, we welcome CDC Director Dr. Rochelle Walensky on the Biden administration's plans to provide a billion free rapid tests and more high quality masks to the American people. Now, here's Mark Maselli, Margaret Flinter, and Dr. Rochelle Walensky. Our guest says she has the great honor of leading the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. During the pandemic, it's been an especially challenging position to be in. Right now, you're gonna hear from her in her own words, direct answers to the most pressing COVID questions as the Omicron variant takes its hold in America. Dr. Rochelle Walensky is an influential scholar. Her pioneering research has helped advance the national and global response to HIV AIDS. Dr. Walensky is also a well-respected expert on the value of both testing and treatment of deadly viruses. And she's been leading the Center for Disease Control for about a year now. Well, welcome, Dr. Walensky. In a Politico story, former CDC Director Tom Frieden said about your job, it is incredibly difficult at any time and inconceivably difficult at this time. I'm wondering, though, if you could comment about the story, because it also reports tensions between you and the Biden team for many months. It said you've been too insular and haven't been sharing information with the administration. What do you want our audience to know about this situation? You know, what I would like to convey is, first of all, how proud I am of the work of this agency, 12,000 people strong, whose job it is um, to quietly but diligently review science and work 24-7 to make sure that we protect uh, America's health and we provide guidance in real time now during a pandemic um, with, uh, you know, with all of the scientific backing that we have and also recognizing that there's some uncertainty right now. Not all of the science is black and white, that there are some gray zones in the science as we learn more and more and as this pandemic gives us more and more curveballs. Well, Dr. Walensky, I think I, uh, I echo those comments that probably never been a more challenging time, though I'm sure some of your predecessors uh, would say that it was equally challenging for them to uh, not an easy job under any circumstances. But I, uh, I'm so glad to have a chance to uh, ask you uh, about this. It, it seemed like a lot of the, the noise or, or criticisms picked up steam when CDC issued the new isolation and quarantine guidelines, and people just seemed to find them confusing. And even uh, in healthcare, when people looked at, okay, there's a conventional uh, isolation and quarantine, then there's contingency, and then there's if it's a crisis. And the, the translation, I think, at least for um, people in, in healthcare, uh, seems to be more like, we just need to get back in and do the job or the healthcare system's going to uh, implode. I wonder if you could share with people, really, what was the, what was the science uh, and the data, the epidemiology that led you to make that decision and and feel that you could safely have those different categories for people? Yeah, thank you for that question. So maybe if I may, just to rewind the clock to the week before Christmas, essentially, Mm -hmm. and what we were seeing was increasing science. We have been standing on the shoulders of two years worth of science Mm -hmm. um, on the transmissibility of SARS-CoV-2, and also an anticipation of a tidal wave of new coronavirus cases Mm -hmm. that we saw based on what was happening in other countries were about to really threaten our our, uh, healthcare infrastructure um, in terms of the number Number of people who were going to be out sick. Um, and so what we wanted to provide for our healthcare workers, given the science and the epidemiology and what was feasible in talking with our public health and healthcare worker partners, was to provide evidence-based um, science on what you should do in certain situations. If you're in sort of peacetime, if things are okay, mm-hmm. if you really have a stressful situation where you're about to close beds because people are out, and really if you're in maximal stress, what are the things that you should do? How should you follow those? And of course, every healthcare institution is going to have to understand where they are in that spectrum. But this was intended to provide the spectrum. Fast forward, and what we were starting to hear was not only was this going to be a problem in healthcare itself, but that we were going to hear about dialysis centers who didn't have their supplies that they needed, dialysis that they needed. We were starting to hear about pharmacists who are out and therefore people couldn't get insulin. And this was really starting to affect a lot of different areas of health. And so that was really the motivation during that time to make sure we had guidance for the general public as well. Well, I think that that underscores the complexity of making decisions. There are so many different factors. But I think generally Americans want to know, uh, when do we expect the Omicron uh, uh, virus to peak here in the United States? 
we know we've heard some good news out of New York City. It seems like it's dropping. But what's the bigger trend as you look out uh, for the entire country? Um, what, what's the timing given the best information you have now? Yeah, from what we've seen from other countries, South Africa specifically, we saw things in South Africa go up really precipitously and then come down actually quite quickly as well. Now, we're, of course, a very bigger, a much bigger country than South Africa and um, a more heterogeneous country, perhaps, than South Africa. Um, but what we can expect um, based on the trends there is that we might see that this wave is actually narrower. So while things are coming down in New York, they may actually not yet have peaked in other areas of the mm -hmm. United States. But what we have generally, uh, what we generally think is that it'll come down faster than prior waves. Hmm. Great. Well, the president had uh, a big announcement uh, that next week there'll be a website for ordering uh, free masks and a way to order free tests at home, which I think will be extremely uh, welcome across America. Uh, any additional details you can tell us about this, when it's going to roll out? And I, I just have to ask you, uh, remembering back to uh, the last national website I can remember in healthcare was when we were ro rolling out the Affordable Care Act. Uh, and everybody was emailing in and kind of crashed the system for a while. Any concerns that you have or you think this is going to be pretty smooth across the country? Um, certainly, this was a terrific announcement today. The administration has been working hard to um, make sure that America has the protection that they need throughout this pandemic. They've recognized through testing that they've needed to do more in this confluence of massive amounts of Omicron cases just around the holidays. There's not only been a shortage of tests here in the United States, but truly globally with mm -hmm. um, Omicron and the number of cases. So working really hard to um, roll out that website, make sure it runs smoothly, and then also to help provide Americans the protection they need, the maximum protection that they need in terms of masking. Well, let me pull the thread on, on masking and re really pick up on Margaret's earlier question of just giving you the opportunity to talk about the science and epidemiology that's been done about uh, cloth mask. Uh, you know, uh, you said that uh, any mask is good. Other experts are saying cloth mask really don't prevent the spread of Omicron. I'm just wondering if you give our listeners some clarity about uh, what, sh what should they be doing? What's, what's the best strategy to stay safe uh, using a mask? Yeah, this is really important. So let me let me clarify and let me just make sure people understand. And we are working to update the information on our masking web page. First of all, it's really important to mask. So um, any mask that you are wearing is better than no mask. And so we really want to make sure that people have a two ply comfortable mask with a wire bridge nose that fits snugly around the face. That is certainly better than nothing. We also recognize that the science demonstrates that there are gradations in the protection of different masks. So there's the cloth mask, the, N the KN95, the N95, and certainly the higher level masks offer more filtration and therefore a higher level protection. They also are pretty well recognized to be harder to tolerate for long periods of time. Mm -hmm. So the best mask that you can get um, that you can wear comfortably is the one that you should wear. Um, but we also recognize if you can't wear those higher level masks comfortably, that you should wear a cloth mask. Perfect. Very clear advice uh, for people. And Dr. Walensky, uh, in our audience, uh, we have a lot of folks that are engaged in community health center work, a lot of folks engaged in education and schools across the country. Uh, these are uh, very important areas for addressing the pandemic. I know there's an effort underway to make sure that these organizations have uh, the testing uh, supplies that they need. What, what's happening on this front and what should health centers or schools across the country do if they're not getting access to these tests? Do they have a, do they have a voice in the administration and a way to get help? Yeah, first of all, let me just say a general thank you for all of the incredible work that you and your partners have been doing in our health care centers, our health centers across the country, um, because it is it has been instrumental in our ability to access um, populations. And we're just very grateful for that partnership. Um, we have uh, an increased community uh, uh, access to testing initiative. We call it the ICAT initiative that is doing more testing in our community health centers um, and also through our school 
schools. So we had a $10 billion from the American Rescue Plan that went to roll out of testing in schools. We at CDC have peer-to-peer -peer, um, consultation. If you're a school and you wanna learn how to do a testing program, if you need referral for testing programs, how to conduct one, some technical assistance, all of that is available from us here at CDC, websites into how to engage and get more tests. So all of that is available. Please do reach out because we, what we do know is that it's critically important for our children to be in school. We also know that during the Delta wave, we successfully had 99% of our kids in school. And then importantly, to keep our kids safe in school, we know it's important to vaccinate them. Um, we have just about 17% of our children between the ages of five to 11 who are currently um, finish their primary series and we really want to increase those numbers so we look to you for some help there as well mm -hmm. well let, let me just pull the thread on that because th th those numbers have been disappointing the five to eleven year old and i think all of us who were doing mass vaccination sites uh and or uh at at, at our regular uh primary care sites knew that the 12 and over we had much better success and um i'm wondering if there's anybody in your family or extended family or among your friends that might have a child in that group that might be resistant to the vaccine i'm wondering what you, would you say to them to try to convince them to take this vaccine yeah really great questions first of all um our, all of our research demonstrates that you all are the the um trusted messengers in this so again we're looking for your help and i know you're out there doing so much to try and get our children vaccinated what i generally do in these situations is is not to talk but to listen what are your concerns because i could convey a whole bunch of data, but in fact, those data don't reflect the concerns of a given parent. So how I generally approach it is say, you know, what are you thinking about? Why, why have you not? Why have you been resistant or reluctant? Um, do you need to talk to other parents who've had their kids vaccinated? Do you want to see the data on safety because it's now publicly available? Do you want to see the data on hospitalizations among those who haven't been vaccinated um, or the data on long COVID? What are the things that are, are uh, making that parent reluctant? Because that's really where you have to um, address, you know, those concerns. So, Dr. Walensky, uh, you're doing a great job of uh, informing and uh, updating the knowledge of our audience. So I'd, I'd like you to maybe just comment on another area, and that is how we're keeping an eye on what might be coming uh, down the pike uh, in terms of variants. We uh, know that you're using genomic surveillance. Maybe explain that a little bit to our listeners to track emerging variants, how, how that works, and, and can you shed any insight into what you are seeing beyond Omicron right now, if anything? Yeah, it's really important. So we work collaboratively in an interagency group um, with CDC and other agencies, including NIH. Um, and what we do is we work with the WHO and examine what is happening internationally, um, all the sequences that are coming in internationally to anticipate what we might be seeing here in the United States. Domestically, what we do is um, we have a genomic sequencing surveillance um, mechanism. Um, we generally sequence in partnership with 19 academic centers, commercial labs, every public health um, uh, state lab, uh, so that we can get a really good line of sight as to the sequences that are out there. How many sequences do we um, do a week? Well, that generally depends on how much disease is out there, but we do tens of thousands a week. Um, and generally what we do is we figure out how many we need by assessing, we want to know if there's a new sequence here in this country down to the 0.1% level. So if there's a sequence at about that level, we want to make sure that we can find it, a variant at that level, we want to make sure that we can find it. And, and when we have lots of, um, lots of disease, that may mean 80,000, 100,000 sequences that we do a week. Um, by doing this surveillance, we were able to start detecting Omicron as early as as December 5th. Uh -huh. Well, let me, you, uh, let me have you just tell us a little more about what you see at that perch. It's kind of interesting. You have both the national picture, but you have this uh, global uh, communication that goes on with your peers who are running similar CDCs around the, around the globe. And I'm wondering, one, what they might be seeing in terms of uh, variants that are keeping you up at night, and also, what are you learning about what they're getting right? Is there somebody that some other country that we're looking at and there's 
probably they're looking to us for certain things that we've been getting right. But what, it, what have they been getting right and, and how do we learn from them? Yeah, it's such an important question and it's such a privilege to be able to work with these other countries to convey science in real time. Um, we meet with many other, many countries many times a week. Um, and it's really just a gift and a privilege to be able to do that. You know, I do think that part of what we need to do is help to vaccinate and protect the rest of the world. I, we have frequently said um, no one is safe until everyone is safe. We do know that uh, variants will continue to emerge. They may emerge here. They may emerge from other countries. We do know a large proportion of populations in other countries are immunocompromised um, and that many of these variants uh, may emerge by uh, harboring and immunocompromised patients who can't mm. clear the virus quickly. Um, and so we really do have a lot of work to do. So that I think is something that we're all watching out for. Certainly other countries have been able to vaccinate higher proportions of their population and we're talking to them about how they've been effectively able to do that. Um, and some of that is, you know, political will in, in different times in different uh, regions of the world. So we, we spend a lot of time thinking about that. Also, um, looking at the data, we've had this great partnership with South Africa and sharing data with other countries as well, with Israel, with UK, um, and just sharing the data that we have in real time and data that they have in real time and, and really um, assessing different policies and how they've played out. Well, Dr. Walensky, uh, you're only the 19th person uh, to lead CDC in its history. And, and for most of that time, uh, CDC has been the trusted voice, particularly, I think, in the public health community. I think the public at large has gotten to know CDC much more uh, over these last couple of years that we've been living through uh, the pandemic. But the, the public is a harsh critic sometimes. I think a Gallup uh, conducted a poll and, and found Americans gave uh, CDC a maybe the largest drop in approval compared to other agencies from 2019 to 2021. And, and certainly a lot of that was uh, prior to your time. How do you turn that around, though, knowing that your ability to have the confidence, right, to have the approval of the public is kind of core to them being able to hear the message on the science and the public health? Yeah, it's a really, I think about this a lot. Um, the first thing I need to convey is that all of our decisions are scientifically driven, scientifically motivated and, and transparent. And I will be out there conveying um, the science. The other thing I need to just acknowledge is we're all tired. Nobody mm -hmm. wants to be in this pandemic anymore and people are mm -hmm. frustrated. Mm -hmm. um, and when people are frustrated, they, you know, go to the root, which is the place that the public health, you know, agency. Um, yeah. I appreciate that frustration. I acknowledge that frustration. And then finally, I think one of the real challenging issues is that the science is evolving. The science is moving, the variants change. When those variants change, the science around them changes. And people want to you know, have a policy and stick with it. Mm -hmm. um, my responsibility to the American public is not to have that mentality, to have mm -hmm. a policy and stick with it until the science changes that it's no longer valued or import, it's no longer um, appropriate. Mm -hmm. And in which case, my responsibility is to change. Um, so I take that responsibility seriously. Um, and, you know, I, I uh, do my best to convey how that science has changed and why the reason for the change. But um, change gray zones, um, especially two years into a pandemic, is really hard right now. Yeah. You know, I want to just pick up on the word frustration. We're seeing so many people acting out and it's getting very, very difficult for many public health leaders, uh, particularly uh, leaders in healthcare or scientists like yourself and Dr. Fauci, you're facing uh, the public health sector uh, front facing. I'm wondering how, how do we handle uh, or how do you all handle the criticism and even met missteps that might have happened? But it seems that it's gone past the level of good dialogue uh, and to being, uh, you know, uh, off putting for maybe young people who are thinking about a public health career. Uh, because it is, I won't say, it, well, I guess it is dangerous uh, at this point uh, to follow the science, and uh, that's very troublesome. 
Yeah, I, I, maybe what I would say in that, first of all, is um, when I went into infectious diseases as a, to, as a trainee, um, never did I imagine that our moment would be that of a pandemic in 2019, 2020. But here is where we are, and this was our calling, and this is what we are here and meant to be doing. So it's hard. There's no question that it's hard, but this is what I was called upon to do. Um, I think there's a little bit of um, misunderstanding that following the science implies that the science is always clear, it's always black and white. Um, science is emerging, um, new science comes every day, sometimes conflicting science emerges. And um, you know, I have this great privilege of working the, with this incredible team, scientific team, where it's a multidisciplinary group. We have immunologists and epidemiologists and, um, and you know, everything in between. And because of that multidisciplinary plenary group, we have robust dialogue about how we interpret new and emerging science. And for the most part, we're unified and on the same page. And I think that that's really terrific. But there is a lot of robust dialogue out there. And we need to understand that that's playing out in, in the public view. Usually it's in scientific meetings, but that is, you know, we should be having that scientific dialogue. Dr. Walensky, we want to thank you for returning to conversations on healthcare for this important talk. Uh, for our audience, CDC's mission is to protect America from health, safety, and security threats, both foreign and in the United States. And you can go to cdc.gov for information on this COVID pandemic and a wealth of other topics. Dr. Walensky, thank you for joining us. And to our audience, thank you all for joining us today for this edition of Conversations on Healthcare. Thanks so much for having me.